This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. I've just been reading about five people who have been sent to prison. They've been found guilty of fraud. The British government apparently gives tax relief to film companies. Um, they said it was going to cost 20 million to make a film, so the British government gave them a grant or tax relief of 2.8 million. But there was no film. They just made it up. So when the, um, the tax authorities said, can we see the film, they hastily wrote out a script and did a trailer, but there was still no film. So they've now been sent to prison for claiming 2.8 million fraudulently for a, a project which never existed. And it's right. People who cheat the system and cheat society, you know this from your P1 studies. We didn't do P1. I didn't pass the set. We don't announce, <laughs> don't announce that too loud. You still know, you still know the principles. You maybe didn't, maybe didn't write enough out. I tell you, you know what that told you the problem is. You used to pass your exams and then you got married. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, we're at the bottom of page 13. Recommendations applicable to financial statements and audits. The board should present a balanced and understandable assessment of the current position and prospects. And if you look in the DEVRO accounts, which you've got in front of you, you'll see that the board has presented a balanced and understandable assessment of the company's history, its position today, and its future prospects. It should maintain a sound system. Oh, I do wish someone would give me a dollar every time I say this sound system of internal control. It's fundamental to your P1 studies, which you may or may not have taken or passed at this stage, but a sound system of internal control. And you auditors are responsible for trying to ensure that the board's established sound system of internal control is in fact a sound system. To safeguard Shell's investment and the company's assets, we should establish formal and transparent arrangements to consider how we should apply financial reporting and internal control principles, and for maintaining an appropriate relationship with the auditors, and this is done through the audit committee. This relationship of a public company's non-executive board and primarily the audit committee has got to be a good, working, close relationship. To the extent that it's the audit committee that decides whether or not to keep on with the existing auditors, or whether it's time we had a change. 29.3 years on average. Corporate Governance Code is now part of the UK Stock Exchange listing rules. If a company is looking to be listed on the Stock Exchange, it has not only to comply with the rules, it has to state that it has complied with the rules. And in addition, if it hasn't, and there are examples where it hasn't, if it hasn't complied with all the rules, it should state the circumstances and the instances when it hasn't complied with the rules and why it hasn't complied with the rules. And if I look again at our directors in Devro, You'll see that in the Corporate Governance Report, the first paragraph on page 24 of the DEVRO accounts tells me that the Chairman, Mr. Hannam, resigned from the Audit Committee on the 9th of June in order to comply with the Code. He attended both Audit Committee meetings in the year under review up to that date. He resigned from the Audit Committee. The very start of the Corporate Governance Report the first few lines of the Corporate Governance Report. As Chairman, the leadership and effectiveness of the Board are primarily my responsibility. We remain committed to high standards of governance, consistent with the needs of the company and the interests of all our stakeholders. Blah, 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 blah. I am confident we have an effective Board to address the opportunities and the challenges which we face. They no longer say on the front page, world leaders in edible collagen, but that's what they are. They're world leaders in edible collagen. What's edible collagen? Not a clue. They used to have a picture, two years ago, they used to have a picture of their products within the financial statements. And it's basically sausage skins. They make sausage skins. 
You know the skin that goes on a sausage? Mm -hmm. Just picture it in your mind. Just think of a sausage and then think of putting a skin on the sausage. <laughs> and these people are the world leaders in the manufacture of those skins for sausages. Mm, they are edible. You can eat them. So you mean uh, in the company who produces the sausage uh, purchases the, uh, the... The edible collagen that they wrap around the sausage. Someone's got to make it. Someone has to do it. So the company who makes sausages can make the skin as well? Right? Well, they don't. The people that make the sausages get dead horses, don't they? Have you been reading that? Mm -hmm. Mm, well, they buy their dead horses, or they, they kill the horses, and then put, make it into sausages, and then buy the cover from these people. And the revenue, <laughs> the revenue in sausage skins comes to 227 million pounds. You wouldn't think there were that many sausages, would you? This is amazing, that's page 35. 34 million profit from operations. No wonder they pay Peter Page £520,000 a year, down from 673000 last year. Okay, <clears throat> I'm on page 14 now. The board should establish formal and transparent arrangements to consider how they should apply financial reporting and internal control principles and maintaining an appropriate relationship with the auditors we've just covered. Stock exchange rules. Comply, and if you don't comply, you have to state why you didn't comply. Provide an explanation. And auditors are required to review these matters. So if they haven't complied, and the next item question may say that they don't want to include it within their corporate governance report because it could be damaging to the company's reputation. And you as auditors have got to say, no, all other financial statements themselves do show a true and fair view. The company has not complied with the code and have failed to give a reason why they haven't complied. At present, there's no international code. In comparison, there's no code for companies listed in the United States. But the SEC have their own strict rules, and in addition, each of the stock exchanges have their own rules. So, it's here. Is it, is it here? Is it in the Baltic States? Corporate governance? Is it the concept of corporate governance of public companies in the Baltic States? No. Have you come across any, any of you? No. Look up next time you have a spare moment, and you're not cooking or cleaning or whatever it is you people do. Look up www.corporategovernance.lt or LV or EE and you'll see that there is a corporate governance code applicable to the Baltic States. Provisions that audit is required to review seven areas of the code in the UK only. You are required as auditors to review that the board has a formal schedule of matters specifically reserved for the board to determine. They can't delegate it. They're not able to delegate it down to executive management. It's areas for the board to make decisions and they should have a formal schedule of these matters and the auditors are required to confirm that the board does have a formal schedule of these matters specifically for board determination. Should be procedure agreed by the board to take independent professional advice. There should be laid down procedures, established procedures within the company. Take these DEVRO ho accounts home with you this evening and read them to your children. Read the corporate governance report to your children, your husbands or loved ones if they're not the same person. Non-executive directors should be appointed for specific terms. Subject to re-election, Companies Act provisions, directors are required to retire every three years on a rotational basis unless they're directors of a top 350 company, in which case they retire every year and submit themselves for re-election. Non-execs are appointed, therefore, the same as the executive directors executive, for every three-year term, unless it's a one-year term should be subject to election by shareholders at the first opportunity after appointment. 
and to re-election at intervals of no more than three years. Names of directors submitted for election or re-election should be accompanied by sufficient biographical details to enable shareholders to make an informed decision. If I look on page 18 and 19, I have some brief biographical details of the directors and these people, or some of them at least, will be seeking re-election at the annual general meeting. Uh, in fact, Mr. Hannam, Mr. Page, Mr. Neep, Mr. Webb, Mr. Withers and Ms. Lodge are all seeking re-election uh, this year according to the notice of the meeting. Should explain the responsibility for preparing the financial statements and there should be a statement by the auditors about their reporting responsibilities. This is part of education and part of expectation gap that every opportunity that the auditor gets, it seems to me, and maybe I'm cynical, but every opportunity that the auditor gets to bring to the attention of management and shareholders that it's management's responsibility for the preparation of the financial statements, for the maintaining the accounting records, for the prevention and detection of fraud and error. It's every opportunity the auditors get, they bring that back again to the attention of the directors. It's in the it, preliminary discussions, it's in the engagement letter, it's in the audit report, it's in the director's report in the financial statements, it's in the management letter that you send every year, Every opportunity the auditors reaffirm and re-emphasize that it's management's responsibility for the preparation of the financial records and statements and for the prevention and detection of fraud and error. Directors should at least annually conduct a review of the effectiveness of the system. And it says so in the accounts in front of you. It says within those accounts that during the year we reassess the strengths of our controls and we're content that the controls are appropriate and adequate for an organisation of our size. The board should establish an audit committee of at least three independent non-executive directors and they should be named in the annual report and they are if you look in those Devereux accounts. If I hadn't give you a set of Devereux accounts you could have looked them up on the internet. If you can't find Devereux you could have looked them up for any other public company and downloaded their sets of financial statements because any reputable company will follow the corporate governance code. And therefore they will say, these are our independent non-executive directors, these are the members of the audit committee. Auditors should obtain appropriate evidence to support compliance statement. The auditors, and therefore on the audit file, will be procedures to confirm that these seven steps above have been followed. You'll probably want a copy of the company's laid down procedures. You'll have a review of the board minutes and minutes of relevant board subcommittees. You'll review relevant supporting documents prepared. Notice that second one. There should be a procedure agreed by the board to take independent professional advice. You make inquiries of certain directors and the company secretary regarding procedure and the implementation of these laid down procedures and attend meetings of the audit committee or the full board if there's no audit committee where the annual financial statements are to be considered and approved. I don't know, I never did that. I never had that opportunity as a trainee and I didn't do it when I had my own clients. I never attended a meeting of the directors but there again the, my audit clients are all small companies and having prepared the financial statements I'd sit down with the directors and we'd go through them and it was not an uncommon thing for my client directors to say I've never understood these I've never understood these pieces of paper how much profit did we make how much tax are we paying that's all they're interested in that's all my clients are interested in so sit down with the directors and talk through the financial statements and, and listen to the directors as they discuss the financial statements and hopefully approve them Non-compliance, page 15, non-compliance with code provisions, where there is a departure, but there is proper disclosure, and the reasons for the departure are identified, no mention is made. But if there's not proper disclosure, or no disclosure at all, then the auditors will report it in their opinion section of the audit report. Audit committees is almost specifically P1. 
it's the main subcommittee of directors, non-executive directors, and they play an integral part in the life of the external auditor. Listed entities should have an audit committee of at least three non-execs. The committee should have written terms of reference dealing clearly with their authority and their duties. But you know, in Devro, they only met twice in the year. The audit committee only met twice. It seems to me that that's, I would have thought, not enough. I would have thought they would want to meet no less frequently than quarterly, and probably even more frequently than that, probably every two months. In Devro, they meet twice a year. And I personally think that that's probably not enough. But who am I? I don't even own shares in Devra. Sausage skins have no attraction for me. Duties of the audit committee should include reviewing the scope and results of the audit, the cost effectiveness, the independence and objectivity. It's the audit committee that will say to the auditors, or say to Deloitte, or in the case of Devereux Price Waterhouse, they'll say, what steps do you take to ensure the continuing independence of the members of your audit team that you send out to us? And Price Waterhouse will reply and say, all of our audit staff, all of our staff, annually sign a confirmation that says that they have no beneficial interest in the shares of any of our client companies. The committee is also responsible for overseeing on behalf of the board and reporting to the board on financial reporting process and the audit, the internal control of the business. The internal auditor appointed by the board of directors will report primarily to the audit committee and the audit committee will then report to the full board. External auditors should be open and honest in their communication. This is, a, this is a tricky one, I would imagine, in practice. I never came across it myself. But PricewaterhouseCoopers, Ernst Young, whatever, when they are discussing matters with the audit committee, there has to be total openness and honesty, total transparency. And I can imagine that could be awkward. It could be awkward. Well, you have suspicions, maybe, where you're not happy about the integrity or competence of a, di a director on the client's board. Are you going to say that to the audit committee? Yes, you should. Open and honest. Transparent. Prior to the audit, matters such as scope the role of the internal auditors, and maybe the involvement of the internal auditors. Audit fees and other services provided should be discussed with the audit committee. Look at that. Matters such as the scope of the audit. The external auditor is responsible for signing an opinion about the truth and fairness of the financial statements. In arriving at that opinion, they have to determine the scope of the work that they feel is necessary in order to have a reasonable expectation of discovering material misstatement, whether arising through fraud, error, or other irregularity. So the external auditors, Deloitte, Ernst Young, Panelker, Foster, whoever they are, will have made their own minds up about what is the scope necessary to give them that reasonable expectation. That's acceptable. But then, before the audit starts, they have to meet with the audit committee and say, this is what we're planning to do. And the audit committee is then going to turn around and say, we think you're doing too much. Or, we don't think you're doing enough. The audit committee does not necessarily have any financial experience. This one does, Devro does, the Miss Brown, whatever she's called. She's uh, a chartered accountant, so she has an idea of the sort of scope that is necessary. But it's not a requirement that an audit committee should have anyone with a financial background. And they potentially are going to turn around to international firms of auditors like PwC and say, we don't think you're doing enough, or we think you're doing too much. I find that unbelievable. And judging from the faces of my audience, you don't care. <laughs> you don't care, do you? You don't. It's... <coughs> It, it, it's not earth-shattering, is it? In your minds, I can see in your faces. So, 
can we move on to page 16 is what you're thinking, isn't it? Well, I'm not there yet, I'm not there, go back. On completion of the audit, the auditor's discussion with the audit committee should cover all matters on which were required by regulation or standard to report, and we should cover the control environment, and we'll discuss with the audit committee, we'll discuss with them the content and detail of our letter of weakness, our recommendation letter. Any differences of opinion between us and management, and how these have been resolved, will bring to the attention of the non-execs the fact that we thought that something should have been treated in one way, but the executive board have said, no, they don't want to do it that way. Any differences of opinion, and the resolution of those differences. Significant adjustments which have been made to the financial statements, but equally, any adjustments which we had hoped would be made, but the executive board have said no. Presumably on the grounds of immateriality, because otherwise we're going to qualify our opinion. And any other observations or other information to be published with the financial statements? Those are matters to discuss with the audit committee having completed the audit, but before the publication of the results. Page 16, Turnbull Working Party. Let me just say now, I'm just going to digress briefly. Very recently, it was announced by the P7 examiner that she was no longer going to allocate marks in an exam for being able to quote ISA numbers and IAS and IFRS numbers. It has been a long-running bone of contention. It's been a long-running discussion on certain accounting websites, accounting tuition websites, that many, many students around the world think that there are marks available for quoting ISA numbers. And I've said, ever since I've taught auditing, there can't be marks awarded for this. It's not worth it. Why would you want to remember the number of an ISA dealing with whatever why would you want them to remember the number? If you ever had to refer to it, you'd look it up. So there is no, definitively, there are no marks available for knowing ISA numbers. The same as in law. There was never any mark available for knowing a section number or a, an act reference. The same in accounting, if you're discussing P2 accounting. You don't have to know the IAS, IFRS numbers. They're not mark worthy. So here we go with Turnbull. I don't think you need to worry about Turnbull. Your examiner's not going to say, what did the Turnbull Working Party decide, as updated by the Flint Review in 2004. Who cares? Surely it's important you know what has been recommended, not the name of the person or the committee that recommended it. The Turnbull Working Party published Internal Control Guidance for Directors on Corporate Governance Code, September 1999. It gives directors guidance on the scope, extent, nature and review of internal controls. Internationally similar codes will be introduced over time. In order to have effective controls, we need to identify objectives, Identify and assess the risks which threaten the achievement of those objectives. Design and operate controls to manage those risks and then monitor them to see they're operating properly. Is this not what external auditors do? Is that not what external auditors do when they're looking at your systems, your accounting and your internal control systems? Are they not identifying where there is a potential weakness within your systems? Identifying that weakness, that risk explaining why it is a risk, and then making a recommendation how to address and minimize that risk occurring. That's what external auditors do in their recommendation letter. That's what Turnbull says. But the profession, the auditing profession, has been doing this for years. Since I was a boy, we've been doing this, weakness letters, identifying weaknesses in internal control and recommending steps that could be introduced to address those weaknesses. The annual report should contain a narrative statement of how the entity has applied the code in respect of internal controls. The auditors are no longer simply auditing income statements, statement of financial position. You're now auditing these other matters as well. The auditor should read the statement 
and seek to resolve misstatements or material inconsistencies with the audited financial statements. And if we do find an inconsistency within the report when compared with the numbers that we're reporting on, and the directors refuse to make an amendment, presumably to the report, then that should be mentioned by the auditor within the auditor's report. It would come not as part of their opinion paragraph, but as a, an other matter to be disclosed, or an other matter to be commented on. Auditors may report, by exception if problems arise, the board's summary of the review is not supported. There's no evidence that we could find that, in fact, management did review their controls. Or it doesn't reflect the auditor's understanding of that process. Or they've not made appropriate disclosure where we failed to conduct an annual review. Or if we have made disclosure, the board has made disclosure, it's not consistent with the auditor's understanding. And in the black box, we've got our example of an opinion. It does show a true and fair view of the company's affairs at the year and profit for the year and its statement of cash flows. And then the other matter. We've reviewed the board's description of the process. In our opinion, the board's comments concerning the review do not appropriately reflect our understanding because, and then explain why. We're now required as auditors to re communicate with those charged with governance, the non-exec board, the non-executive, and particularly the audit committee, about any explanation of why significant accounting practice acceptable according to the financial reporting requirements are not appropriate to the entity. An explanation of why it's not appropriate. Documentation of matters communicated orally and communication of difficulties encountered during the audit. If you've come across problems during the audit, we need to tell the audit committee because they can put power and can put influence on the executive board and things can then get changed. Page 17. Law and regulations. We plan and perform audit procedures, evaluate and report on the results. And we recognise that non-compliance with law or regulation could materially affect the financial statements. Here we go again, the responsibility of the directors. They have to take appropriate steps to provide reasonable assurance that we do comply with law and regulation. How do you do that? How does management take appropriate steps to make sure they're in compliance with all applicable laws and regulations? How does that happen? Well, they may be big enough to have their own separate legal department. Big companies do. Substantially big companies do. Alternatively, they could employ a firm of solicitors to keep them up to date with relevant law and regulation applicable to the company. I read recently, about two years ago, of a barrister, the company's very high-powered legal representative, who was in court as a, an accused. He was accused of insider dealing. And he'd been advising his own company about a takeover that they were about to suffer. They were going to be the, the one being taken over. And he was advising this company, his own company that was employing him. And he contacted his father-in-law on Saturday. And the announcement was going to be made on Tuesday at 11 o'clock. Monday was a holiday, it was a bank holiday. And he contacted his father-in-law on Saturday and said, buy as many shares as you can afford, borrow some money from the bank and buy loads of shares in this company that I work for because we're going to be taken over and the announcement is on Tuesday at 11 o'clock. Monday was a bank holiday, so the father couldn't get to the bank, the bank was closed. But Tuesday, he went down very early, he negotiated a loan with the bank manager and bought hundreds of thousands of shares in this company which was going to be announced to be taken over at 11 o'clock on Tuesday morning. And the announcement came and the shares shot up, came, the shares shot up and the father-in-law sold the shares making a substantial profit. 
He calculated the profit, divided it by two, and paid half of the profit into his son-in-law's, the barrister's, bank account. Exactly half. To the penny, exactly half. And there was an investigation on the takeover. Not just a normal, routine investigation. Has there been any strange activity in the company's shares within the two months prior to the takeover? And they discovered this substantial profit which had been made. The man bought the shares at half past nine on Tuesday morning, sold them at half past eleven on Tuesday morning, and made £115,276.32 profit. And then half of that amount was seen to have gone into his son-in-law's account, the barrister of the company. The barrister said it was a repayment of a loan. It's just a coincidence that it happens to be exactly half of the profit that my father-in-law made. Was he punished? Yeah. Prison. Prison. Don't drop the soap. He went to prison for it. And bless him, so he should. Where am I? Oh, take appropriate steps to provide reasonable assurance that we comply with law and regulation. Establish arrangements for preventing non-compliance with law or regulation and detecting any that do occur. If we do know the laws and regulations that we should comply with, then we need to monitor our compliance and make sure that we are consistently, regularly in compliance and we do not breach that law or regulation. And prepare financial statements to give true and fair view of the state of affairs and of its profit or loss for the year. And this is what we could do. Steps which may assist the directors to discharge their responsibilities. Just put this into the context of your own employer. Does your employer maintain a register of laws and regulations which affect you? Do you have a register that you can check up on on the internet or a hard copy in the filing cabinet? Laws and regulations which affect us. Those of you in manufacturing companies, those of you who are auditors, do you make sure that your client has a record of the laws and regulations which affect them? Is that an audit step? Look me in the eye and say that. Hand on heart and say that. Yeah, I make sure that all my clients have a register of laws and regulations. You know all the law in your country which affects your clients? Not all the laws in well, you should do. Don't say not all. You should do. No, I did say all the law which does affect you. Of course you do. Of course. You. How can you be an auditor if you don't know all the laws and regulations? Quite right. I'm proud of you. Proud of you. Monitoring legal requirements and any changes therein. And ensuring that operating procedures are designed to meet these requirements. Instituting and operating appropriate system. Going back to this law and regulation. It's only people like me who tell people like you that by the year 2014 there should be at least 40% of the board of directors shall be women. Because if I didn't tell you, well, maybe for the big four accountancy firms you'd have an internal course that told you. And maybe for those of you in manufacturing with parent companies in Chicago, maybe Chicago would tell you. But does Chicago keep records of that sort of detail? Of European subsidiaries? Of course they do. Instituting and operating appropriate systems of internal control. This is what directors should do in order to help them prevent and detect non-compliance. Developing code of conduct, ensuring employees are properly trained in and understand provisions, maintaining compliance and taking appropriate action. I'm thinking there particularly things like health and safety regulation or legislation. Making sure that all your employees are aware. I gave three people a lift this morning when I was coming into town. There were three people standing on the forest road in the snow and looking very cold. So I gave them a lift. And before I set off, I said, they, of course, they didn't speak English. And of course, I don't speak their language. But I did indicate my seatbelt. And before I set off, I made sure that, because it's the law. It's also the law that I shouldn't be 
smoking in one hand and a telephone in the other hand and driving at speed through your capital city. But it does happen frequently, regularly. I was just standing in a car park about half an hour ago and a woman drove in and she got a phone in one ear and a cigarette in the other and she's turned a corner to go into the car park. And I think the standard of driving here is superbly better than anywhere else I've ever known. How you can drive with a cigarette in one hand and a phone in the other and still maintain control defeats me. Just occasionally they don't maintain control. And you see that on a regular basis as well. Engaging legal advisors to assist in monitoring legal requirements. Maintaining a record of complaints. A record of complaints. Have you ever seen one? Because nobody complains about your company. Do you make sure that your clients have a record of complaints? And you tick it every year to make sure that all the complaints have been identified and audited. <laughs> Procedures when possible non-compliance is discovered. When we become aware of information which indicates non-compliance, we need to obtain an understanding. And again, this is an expression which you should find yourself using within the P7 exam. It is important that the auditor should get a thorough understanding of the circumstances which have given rise to this situation. The, obtain, the auditor should obtain a thorough understanding of the nature of the act and the circumstances in which it has occurred and sufficient other information to evaluate possible effect on financial statements. Non-compliance with law and regulation should be documented discussed with appropriate level of management. I presume appropriate level of management should be the audit committee. Should consider the implications in relation to other aspects and particularly the reliability of written representations. If the directors are openly breaking the law or non-compliance with law or regulation, if they are doing it and they know they are doing it, then that rings alarm bells in an auditor's mind that the directors consciously are breaking the law, are consciously uh, ignoring regulation. And in that situation, how reliable are management? What reliance can you place on their written representations? Page 13, Chapter 3, Regulatory Environment. We're into corporate governance now. We're into P1. The system by which companies should be directed and controlled, it came from Cadbury Report back in 1992. If you remember anything of your P1 studies, you will remember that. It's a code of best practice, it's not law. The Corporate Governance Code, the UK Corporate Governance Code, introduced in 2010, is the combined combination of a number of recommendations and reports which have been made by various people building up to the aggregation of these reports. It's a good code to follow for listed companies, but it's not restricted to listed companies. Corporate governance is a good thing, and if it's a good thing for a company, why should it not be a good thing for an individual, or for a part an individual in business, or for a partnership, or for an unlisted company, or for an NGO, or for a non-profit making school, university, police force, why should corporate governance not be a good idea for them as well? It's split between rules applicable, guidance given to directors, to the relations with shareholders, and with reference to financial statements and audit. Applicable to directors, you know this, a division at the head of the company. The chair and the chief executive should be different, should be separate. If you look in the Devro accounts, Hannon is the chair and Peter Page is the chief executive. The division of head, a division at the head of the company, between people of equal strength in charisma. equal charismatic strength so that no individual 
can dominate the company. And one of the, one of the classic characteristics of companies going into failure was because individuals, too much power was given to an individual. And so by splitting that power at the top of the company, uh, it makes a balance at the head of the company. Interesting that in Devro, if you look on the, um, the top two, Steve Hannum um, did used to work, the fourth line, he used to work for a company called Aviagen, and he's the non-executive chair. And then Peter Page, who's the chief executive of Devro, on the on the third line, he held senior positions with Adnams and then with Aviagen. Oh, look at that! They used to work together. Should be and be seen to be independent. Me being a cynic would suggest that these two had a personal inverted commas friendship and I don't mean anything um, hidden by that and I'm not insinuating anything. They seem to have had a personal friendship before the appointment of Hannon. Who audits this company? Do you know? It's actually one of the big four and Simon Webb was only taken over as Chief Group Finance Director in 2011. Before he took over, um, there was another man in charge who qualified with PricewaterhouseCoopers and PricewaterhouseCoopers are the auditors. So the Chief Group Finance Director, before he resigned last year, was a former employee of the auditors. It doesn't say in Simon Webb, but it did say last year the company is a, uh, a chartered accountant. It doesn't say with whom he qualified, but it did say last year and he also qualified with Coopers and Lybrand, who of course merged with Pricewaterhouse. So there's an element of cynicism which I'm going to bring in there. I have not the slightest doubt that Simon Webb is an honourable man and that Peter and Steve, although they had a personal relationship before Steve joined, nevertheless they do operate independently. I'm not in any way suggesting anything different. It's just that it isn't, it's not seen to be independent. Okay, division of duties at the head of the company. I'm back in the notes. At least half the board should be non-executive. In Devro, there are only two executive directors. There are only two, Simon and Peter. Simon Webb and Peter Page are the only two executive directors. All the other directors, five of them, are non-exec. And that's right, at least half the board should be non-exec. Why? Because at board meetings, if it's a unified structure, a unitier structure, at board meetings, you don't want the executive board to be dominant over the non-executive board. It's all right for the non-execs to dominate the executive, but not the other way around. Chair should ensure that all directors are properly briefed on issues re-arising. And as, as auditors, you ought to see visible evidence and have a copy of the visible evidence of the briefing notes which have been given to the board members in readiness for them having their board meetings. The Chamber of Commerce, the local Chamber of Commerce here, if there's any particular matter to be discussed, the board members of the Chamber of Commerce are given detail, admittedly it's succinct, it's brief detail, but enough detail for us to know what is the, um, uh, what are the salient, what are the important points about the matter to be discussed. Directors should be appointed every three years and receive appropriate training when they're first appointed. How often should auditors be changed? How often should you change your auditors? Yeah, it's a recommendation which is going through Europe at the moment. There's European talk of changes and tightening governance and the rules relating to the rotation of auditors. That was a bit that I gave you earlier, that you should have at least two tenders, two people tendering for the audit. 
Seven years is the recommendation. What is the average period for the FTSC, the top 100 companies in the UK? What is the average period of time served by auditors for the top 100 companies in the UK at the moment? No, the average term is 29.3 years. Oh. Twin, well, because auditors are auditors. Once you're in, you're in. And unless there's some good reason to change it, then you keep, so you keep going on. But the recommendation is you should come down to seven. Italy tried it. Italy tried rotating auditors every three years, which, thinking about it, is actually very stupid. Um, the first year of any audit is always very expensive. There's a big learning curve, a steep learning curve, an expensive learning curve. The second audit, you're taking advantage of that learning curve, and so you're beginning to make a reasonable uh, return as an audit firm. You're beginning to think about making a reasonable return. The third year, you can start making profits, but then at the end of the third year, you stop and get another new firm in. So it didn't really make any sense, and they've abandoned that now. Italy has abandoned changing auditors every three years. But this thing about tendering, and it's tendering every year, this European recommendation, that it should be open to tender every year, and at least two tenders should be received, and if we don't choose the lowest one, we have to justify why we didn't. And so that's going to give rise to some expensive audits, I think. Directors should be appointed every three years. They should receive appropriate training when they're first appointed. This is particularly applicable to non-executive directors they should be induced or inducted into the customer company's systems, activities, customers, suppliers, products. The induction course should cover all the major elements of what you would want to know if you were an auditor, for instance. You'd want to know about the products, the customers, the competitors, the suppliers. You'd want to know that. And these new non-executive directors should be inducted into the company uh, in order that they are conversant and familiar and educated with reference to the company's activities. If it's an FTSE company, that's interesting, again this is new, all directors should be appointed every year. If you're in the top 350 companies in the UK, then every director shall resign every year and if they wish, shall seek re-election every year. Levels of remuneration should be sufficient to attract, retain and motivate directors and the proportion should be related to performance. If you look at the remuneration report on page 28 for seven pages, up to page 34 in the uh, published accounts which I've given you, <coughs> there's policies given... Somewhere in there, and I can't instantly see it. Somewhere in there, in there it will say that the level of, level of remuneration is considered to be sufficient to attract, retain, and motivate, or incentivize. Attract, retain, and incentivize. But I can't see it there. But you see on page 29 of these financial statements, You'll see the element of remuneration, the base salary, the annual bonus, the deferred share bonus plan, the performance share plan. And Mr. Page, bless him, in 2010 he earned 673,000. In 2011 it's fallen down to just over half a million. Only half a million. Deary me. Can you dream of earning £10,000 a week? Well, that's all I can do. I can only dream about it. Jeez. It's alright, isn't it? You get by. I struggle through. But, ladies, gentlemen, you can get yourselves into this position if you qualify and pass these exams. 
The remuneration committee should be established. It should be comprised of non-execs. Details of remuneration policy and remuneration paid should be in the financial statements. We've just looked at those in that set of financial statements. Those applicable to relations with shareholders, the guidance from the UK Corporate Governance Code, <coughs> companies should be ready to enter into dialogue with institutional investors. Who are the institutional investors? The big ones, the insurance companies, the pension funds, the um, investors in industry, the banks. Uh, these are institutional investors. These are people, not like me, who buys 500 shares at a time. I'm, I'm a mere nothing. I'm talking about people who are buying 2 and 3% of a public company's shares. These are the institutional investors. And these are important investors so far as the company is concerned. Because if they sell their shares, it generates... Mm, what's the word? Confusion? No. Distrust? No. It generates uh, a falling of... I've lost a word. Confidence. Falling of confidence in the company. If 2% of Devro were to sell their shares and say to their broker, sell all our millions of shares in one go, that's going to shatter the confidence of the market in the company. And that's not good. It destroys the market capitalization and possibly reduces the ability of the company to borrow money on favorable terms. So it's not good for anybody. So we should be enter, ready to enter into dialogue with institutional investors. The annual general meeting is used to communicate with private investors and encourage their participation. People like me, my 500 shares, I ought to attend <coughs> public company annual general meetings and join in the discussions and say, Mr. Chair or Madam Chair, can I raise a point here? I ought to do that. Of course, I never do because my voice is never going to be influential in any way. So apathy rules. Shareholders, as a generalization, shareholders in public companies are apathetic. They have no real active interest in their, their invested company. Institutional investors have a responsible, responsibility to make considered use of their votes. They should bear in mind the interests of other shareholders at the same time as they bear in mind their own interests. When British Telecom came to the market in the UK, <coughs> a number of years ago now, when it was privatized and, and the public were invited to buy shares in British Telecom, there were, I think it was 8 million separate shareholders as a result of that privatization. And for the first annual general meeting, the company hired the biggest exhibition hall in, in the UK, uh, the, um, I forgot what it's called, it's so long since I've been there, um, National Exhibition Centre in Birmingham. And they ran, they organised trains to come up from London and across from South Wales and up from the depths of the southwest of England, coming down from the top northeast, down from Northumbria and Lancashire, all over the country. Trains were organised to bring these people to the National, National Exhibition Hall. And I think I'm right, I think it was something like 800 people turned up out of 8 million. Generally, people are apathetic. 800 empty trains coming up from London with nobody on them apart from the, the ticket collector and the big four partner who wanted a free train ride. 